No Gains Without Pains, An Oral History of the Civil Rights Movement in Louisiana. Will they remember, will history remember, the pains, the struggle of the civil rights movement in Louisiana? Mr. Oliver Bush, who more than 25 years ago filed the first suit to desegregate the public schools in New Orleans, wonders about the young people. Will they remember? I, I don't know whether or not uh, do are they told about these things? Do they know about the the the, the, uh, the uh, things that the uh, that the older people have gone through in all areas, not only the school but the whole total package of civil rights for blacks, the constitutional the rights that the Constitution give all American citizens. I'm not sure that. They are aware of it or think about it serious enough. The purpose of this program is to help remember, to preserve an important part of American history, to put on record what was involved, what was accomplished, and what was the cost in human terms that concern us all. Mr. Bush and 16 others personally involved in the civil rights movement in Louisiana tell us in their own words. As one of the narrators, J.K. Haynes explains, written history won't reflect what I tell at this time. So, in their own words, Mr. Daniel Byrd and Mr. Robert N. Perry begin by recalling the humiliations of Jim Crow segregation in New Orleans, resulting in one of the earliest boycott protest movements. Their conversation goes on to describe how far the movement would have to go, how much would have to be overcome. Shown interviewed at St. Stephen's Baptist Church in New Orleans, Mr. Byrd was in charge of education problems for the national office of the NAACP. Mr. Perry was a concerned school principal, a leader of the Boy Scouts and the Louisiana Education Association. But I don't think, I, I hate to say it, I don't think they fully appreciate what was done for them. Because I can remember, as a spiritual, I can remember when there was this, you may think I'm lying. There was a single bathroom that a Negro could go on Canal Street except the Southern Railroad Station. And you had to walk from Basin and Canal, if you got in the middle of the all the way to the L&N Station, and maybe the toilet was locked. Because yeah. as soon as you the past the one train time was locked, and you had to have a ticket to go to the bathroom. You can imagine. I found myself in the South getting married. No drinking fountains. No eating places, no place where I could buy clothing and where I could get a meal. And one of the first difficulties that I ran into was the boycott of most of the stores in Orleans, Paris. Maison Blanche, Orleans, and all of the stores except Krieger's, Holmes, and God shows didn't allow Negro women to try on the better hats and the better undergarments next to the skin. When I came here, the children were about oh, six and about eight years. And they had some friends of ours who were members of the Sunday school, so we used to go down the streetcar to Sunday school every Sunday morning. And some days I wouldn't sleep at church because it'd be too long for the children. And we'd take the streetcar, get on Canal Street, and go to the river, get on the, keep our transfers, and go across the ferry once or twice. That was that Sunday they came from, then come back 
to St. Charles Avenue and take the St. Charles car up to Audubon Park and let them, we would all just walk through and see things. One day we simply decided we'd sit. We sat in the park. I'd been there about 10 minutes. This great big burly police saw this great big beautiful horse. The horse was pretty. And I can't say the same for him. <laughs> hey, what you <laughs> doing in this park? I said, we're just sitting here, the children. I tried to start it down and say, they're tired. Well, let them go rest some other so-and-so place. There ain't no place <laughs> here. Well, I, you know how embarrassed I was for the children's sake. I wasn't worried about what he said myself. So we started out. Now, just out of Waterman Park, they had a merry-go-round, a uh, little train, and all these things. And Robert said to me, Daddy, let's go ride the train. I said, son, it's not working today. I said, it's not working today. I was anxious then because we walked straight back and come on to Herbert Street and come home. I said, it's not running today. I'm sorry, Robert. We come some other day. And just as I said, it's not running, ding a ling 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 <laughs> it comes down the track. And you know how I felt. <laughs> and I've always remembered that. Without the right to vote, black citizens could do little to end segregation. And getting registered to vote was often very difficult, even impossible. Yeah, a few voted, yeah. but not a couple of hundred, not so, yeah. enough to amount to anything. Yeah. Uh, they, they actually lost out. See, they had a, a tricky registration form. I am now so many days, so many years, months, and days year old. I went down 17 I, times to register. And, uh, 17 times. 17 times. I, I am not now registered in a ward or precinct except and uh, uh, things like that. And uh, they'd ask you, they do pull some of the stuff like they pull in Alabama and Mississippi. Uh, you would answer all the questions correctly. I remember a couple of cases I was on, registration cases. I got a college professor, he had a master's degree and schooled him on every question, he knew it. He answered them correctly. He said, uh, Professor, how many bubbles in a bar of soap? How many peas in a pick? That's right, yeah, all that kind you of You know, thing. that kind of stuff. And the only way I got registered was because the executive of the Boy Scouts, and he was not so much in favor of Negro people, so they said. I was working as a scout executive then. I worked for five years in 1942 to 47. And I told him, I said, Mr. Crow, you know, I'm kind of, I don't feel like I'm a man. He said, why? I said, in Georgia, I could register. I said, I haven't even been able to register here. He said, what? I said, no, I haven't been able to register. He said, you put on your scholar's uniform. I said, I've been down 16 times. I told him, I threw out a couple of lists. I said, there's the list. Each time the man's car said, no, it's wrong. I said, what's wrong? I can't tell you that. <laughs> and then a man who couldn't read, couldn't write, and then stand beside me, and the man said, put this there. I mean, he could write very little. Put this here, he could print. Put this here. Okay, it's all right. Raise your hand. He said, you go down there tomorrow. Buy your scholar's uniform. I'm going to give you time. To go. You go down there. I must let me know what happens. Undoubtedly, it must have been forewarned when I came in. Wrote the card exactly the same way, just added a date to my age. Just like that. It was hard to deny the right to vote to a man in uniform, even if it was the uniform of the Boy Scouts. Mr. J. Carlton James, a retired educator and native of Lafayette, was one of the first blacks to register to vote in Lafayette Parish after Reconstruction. He recalls the time when he was a veteran just back from World War II. But in 1946, to be exact, on March the 4th, is when we attempted to register uh, for the first time. But we had, in New Orleans, we had had a conference in New Orleans trying to come into the enfranchisement of Negroes, as we call it at that time, because it was time to make a move. The soldiers wanted to make a move, the veterans, as we call them, wanted to make a move, and other organized people wanted to make a move. We went to a workshop. Somehow or another, somebody Xeroxed a copy of the, of the, uh, the blank, the form. They made a sample form. 
And uh, somebody who got it from the print shop or somewhere else, well, we began printing sampling forms to study the form to see what was on it, what wasn't on it. So <clears throat> on uh, March the 3rd, some 14 of us have decided, well, we're skilled enough now to go ahead and try to register. So the morning, only four of us showed up. Wallace James, my father, same old old year junk man, Clifton J. Mouton, and Undertaker, and myself. Since I just got out of, out of service, well, I put on my my uniform, my army uniform, and went on up there. We figured that he couldn't deny a soldier the right to register <laughs> if he showed up, you know. So we walked into the registrar's office, and Mr. Ebay was the registrar at the time, and he said, what y'all want? I said, we come to register. Well, he was so nervous, he didn't know what to do at that particular time with us, one way or the other. I said, well, uh, uh, all right, all right. So I sat down, I was the first one. He passed it to me, and I heard him got through. He said, wait a minute, you got to interpret the Constitution over here. So he got the book out. It looked to me like he must have been about a fourth or fifth grader, you know. And he uh, began asking some questions, what this and what is that and what's the other thing. Well, we were answering rather fast, so he figured, well, there must be something on it. And some of us, <laughs> when he looked at the farm and saw that some of them had finished college, others had finished high school, <laughs> he said, well, he, he must be better off than me. So he, he arrested all of us that day. But they registered. But they wouldn't name who they were or anything else. They tried to push it out to people for a while. But in July of that same year in the big city of Broad Bridge, you know, the, the center of the Confederacy in this area, uh, our own uh, representative got up there and he was a big speech maker and he said before Negroes would vote in the, in the city of Lafayette or in the parish of Lafayette, he'd walk up to blood up to his neck. So three, four days after I, we read in the paper, we happened to meet him. And I told him, I said, well, I didn't know anybody could ever walk their blood it's up to their neck. I thought they had to swim in it when it got that deep. But the greatest thing that helped us was some 14 months afterwards, the late Jules B. Jamard, Bishop of Lafayette, placed it within the newspaper and from the pulpit, the fact that every man living on the face of the earth or facing around here is a citizen and he's entitled to vote. And from that point, I think the great emphasis took part, uh, took place between white and black, you had long lines going in there. After the bishop said you could do it, it was good for you to do. Before that, I guess it must have said it was a sin or something. But Voter registration drives spread across the state. Workshops were held at Southern University. A wide range of black organizations worked together to teach people how to register, and effective leaders emerged. One of these men was Mr. J.K. Haynes. But as we went across the state, we would work with these people on voter registration uh, voter education project. We called it citizenship education to camouflage it so that the uh, white racists in Louisiana wouldn't uh, get us out of town. But uh, if we had in the more recalcitrant areas where they didn't, they wouldn't permit uh, the blacks to register and vote, then we would call in one of the attorneys and file a suit. Uh, for instance, Boja Parish was one of the typical il illustrations. Uh, we organized Zelma Wythe and the group up in Tallulah and filed a suit, and uh, Sheriff Hester finally ran the lawyers out of town. Mr. Haynes tells, with ironic understatement, of outrageous acts perpetrated against blacks who tried to register, or even against those who were mistakenly assumed to be trying to become registered voters. And then a rather interesting case was in uh, St. Landry Parish. Uh, your parish, Doris, we filed a suit for some schools. They, St. Landry didn't have a single decent school for black people. And Dr. Donata and some of the others left town, and, and correspondingly, Mitchell filed a suit for registration and voting, and Attorney Turo and Lewis Berry were the attorneys in that case, and they found it rather convenient to kill him. And Alvin Jones took a group of French-speaking boys into Opelousas to try to register and vote, and they beat up Alvin and the boys, and Al Alvin subsequently died. Uh, and uh, there was a case that the uh, French-speaking boys went in to try to register for the army, and they thought they were coming to register the vote, and they beat them unmercifully. And that was the sort of history of uh, St. Landry Parish until uh, uh, Middle Spawn, Dauphine, uh, led a movement to organize branch of the NAACP, and and, and so on, and Cat Doucette and Judge Leslie Gardner and, and, and Fontenot came on the scene. And, and they found that here was an untapped resource that they could use. And, and uh, then voter registration started in St. Landry Parish. 
A note of humor was introduced when Mr. Vanu D. LaCour, a respected civil rights attorney, explained what happened when white politicians decided to let a few blacks register in St. Landry Parish. What happened was uh, Murphy's, Reverend Murphy's, whatever, I never have been able to find out what his approach was and what uh, they were to get out of, of it, but Richard Milford got a call from Mr. Old, old Man Austin who said, we're going to give in. We'll, 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 we'll compromise with you. And we'll let, if you bring the people to vote tomorrow morning. And we, uh, I, I think what they had in mind was they were going to, going to register that token number. They registered one one day. Yeah, well, they registered one one day. That's right. Then he told us, if you bring the wheel help, and, and what we did, we were so so together and organized, we got, got, got a whole, about five busloads of people. And when they appeared that morning, they all registered. And that was the breakthrough in St. Landry. And I think, uh, oh, with St. Landry, in, in some of his practices, with, with, then was the head of a lot of the other areas in the state. Besides voter registration, the major area of protest was in the area of education. Carlton James remembers what black schools were like when he was a young teacher. I taught at Ridge. My first assignment was at Ridge in the second ward in uh, 1936 through 39. What did you have in the way of books, supplies? supplies? What you had, when I walked into school, there was one table and one bell and nothing else but a chalkboard. What did you do for books? We were supposed to go to the white school and get some books and I walked up there to the front of the school to go into the principal's office, you know, and he said, politely, send me around to the back. Come to the back, you're going to come through to this school. So he and I had a row right then. Because, however, I got the books and brought them over there. And uh, at least the man said you didn't have, he had second-hand books. He never knew what a new book was. And the children brought chairs from their homes. But we, we were responsible for expanding the school in a rural school to nine months. After two years in the country, you know, one thing I'd tell them, I'd say, you know, Negro children must be awfully small. They can learn in seven months what it take white folks to learn in nine months. What are some of the problems which uh, developed uh, in that process of desegregation? Well, it was clandestine in order for us to get clients to, to take and uh, try to uh, become interested in desegregating the schools after the law was passed. Three of us we used to go out at night and talk to families, and it was kind of hard. We had 14 families who were on the borderline to want to enroll their children. Uh, all but three of them couldn't stand the pressure. So we decided we would go with Nelson Trahon. Nelson was independent. He walked around with his shotgun. Nobody bothered him. He on land, you know, in the, seventh, in the uh, second ward. So we decided we'd go with him and his daughter. Well, all right, uh, there were others who signed also. Mr. Johnny Jones, a Baton Rouge attorney, gives the point of view of the child who was victimized by the educational system. Well, I came from West Philadelphia Parish, and in, that is one of the parishes that they did not have a high school. They did not have uh, nine months schooling for blacks in that parish. They only had three months of schooling. I went to three months schooling there, which, is, which was public schooling, and my daddy hired the teacher, Mr. Dawson, another three to four months. And he would pay that teacher, you know, 50 cents a, a week or 50 cents a month or whatever we could afford. And uh, many days we went to school, was only two, two persons in school, myself and my brother George. And then recently after that, two other persons joined us and went to school. And uh, I recall one day after all the black were in school, only two of us was in, and that was over. We had gone for about a month, and uh, the white man just rode up to my daddy one day and told him that uh, he had to put all of us in the field, and that we had to go to the field just like all other <laughs> And uh, my daddy just told him, say, well, now, if he, if he says he wants to go to the field, he goes to the field. He's talking about me. And if, if he says he doesn't want to go to the field, he doesn't go to the field. The courage of such individual parents who wanted better opportunities for their children is something to admire. 
but organized efforts were required to change the system. One of the organizers was J.K. Haynes, who has spent most of his life in the struggle for equality education. Uh, black teachers were working for one-third of what uh, white teachers in Louisiana were working. Uh, and then if you look at the facilities, there were no facilities. Black uh, youngsters were going to school in one-room shanties and in churches and that kind of uh, thing. And there were numerous parishes where there was no high school for blacks. And this was in, in 1952, which is not a long time ago. Now, the Louisiana Education Association realized that it could not uh, operate effectively uh, as an entity in itself. So it, it uh, developed a, 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 a collusion, uh, whatever you want to call it, with the NAACP and the Legal Defense and Educational Fund of the NAACP. And Thurgood Marshall came down and helped us to set up a legal program. But uh, moving along from there, uh, we developed the idea that <clears throat> the only way to uh, break down the barriers that circumscribed uh, blacks in, and, uh, in education was to democratize the whole education system. And this is when we began to file suits for uh, the uh, desegregation of public, well, what we thought at that time, the integration of the public education system. The Bush case being the first case, and uh, the meeting, the first time we met with Mr. Bush was in the basement of the Lawless uh, Elementary School in the, in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans. As a national NAACP official, Mr. Daniel Byrd played an important role in the Bush case. We went into the education facilities, examined them, made a study of them, and we presented a petition to the Orleans Parish School Board citing numerous inequalities in education. The Orleans Parish School Board elected to do nothing about it, and therefore we called a strike. But there was one parent there named Oliver Bush who had a son who went to this school, and Bush took offense to what the school board said, and he filed a lawsuit. There were parents all along who took offensive to it. We decided to hit segregation head on with the Bush case. Then the, the storm broke all over the United States. Suit after suit was filed. We discovered the limitations that we had on these suits, but they came anyway. The money was not there, but we filed them anyway. And there were a number of suits filed. There were 30-some suits filed at one time calling for integration in, edu uh, in, ed in education at the elementary secondary level. Mr. Byrd took us to meet Mr. Oliver Bush, the indignant father who filed the landmark suit. We interviewed Mr. Bush in the, his Texaco station in New Orleans. Well, the, uh, the suit was filed merely because of the, uh, I saw the inadequacy in and the school system for both groups and uh, buildings, the uh, facilities, well that would be the building, cover the building, the working material, and the whole setup was entirely different in the black schools than the white schools. I had had opportunity to go into some of the white schools and see the vast difference in what they had to offer and, and what we had. And I had, uh, I was working with PTAs at the time, president of PTAs, got around quite a deal to make some comparisons. And I had 13 kids of my own. And I felt that uh, as a taxpayer, uh, we was entitled to much better than we was getting. So that was the motivating factor. That was the motivating factor because I was dissatisfied with what we had in our school by comparison with the other schools. I gave it some thought, but uh, uh, knew it, I felt that the, uh, the good that would come out of it, even if I had to sacrifice my life, would far outreach the price that I would have to pay as an individual. How did the young students who first attended all white schools feel? How did they get the courage to be the first? Miss Myrtle Kane was the first black student to enter Crowley High School. I finally had the opportunity to do something about it. 
and they started issuing forms freedom of choice. So I brought the paper home. You out of all the people, you know why, they couldn't understand why. But I was determined and I filled the form out and you know pleaded with them to sign. But I had other uh, objectives. I, I didn't want to just attend the school. I wanted to become involved. So I had to join my first. I, I started gathering information about the type of activities that I could participate <coughs> in. And one of them was Topperettes, the marching group. And I parked the car and got out and walked through the gate. And I'll never forget that. Everything stopped. And all eyes was on me. How did you feel? A little scared, a little nervous, a lot of tension. I was in a very highly emotional state because I didn't know what they would do. I didn't know how the students would accept me. I just didn't know. And each step I took closer toward the crowd. Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't want to turn back, but. You know, all of a sudden you have this outburst of, of noise and then everything stops and everybody's looking at you. Every, everybody was just looking at me. And uh, the first word spoken was, are you coming here? I said, yes, I am. And I'm here now to find out information of how I go about of joining this marching group. Complete silence. I stood there. They looked at me and I looked at them. And one of the students started talking to me about, you know, the procedures and what should I do. And my mother somehow found a white lady that had a daughter in topperettes and had a uniform and she purchased the uniform from them. And that's how I got my uniform. And uh, you speak of the fly in a bowl of milk. Well, that's what I was, a fly in a bowl of milk. I was the only spade, the only black person. There were bad times. I remember our trip to Natchez, Mississippi. I have to, t I have to say this. Uh, we went visit the plantation homes in the tulip gardens. And um, I was, again, the only black in the FHA club. The only blacks you saw were the peddlers on the streets the butlers and the maids dressed in uniform to open the doors, receive the tickets, you know, this type of thing. Here I came, dressed just as well as the whites, better than some, you know, in with them a group. And uh, I walked into this one plantation home, and this was an elderly white lady. And when she turned around and saw me, it was like, Somebody was holding a double barrel to her head, about to pull the trigger, you know. The expression she gave me, and she jumped, you know, and she says, Oh, 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 you know, when did this start? When did this start? When did they start letting these s***s in here like us, you know? And this, this, at first, I just wanted to reach out after her, you know. I became a little belligerent, but... I would have defeated my own purpose because this was not my purpose, you know. I, I had planned in my heart to take, to take it as long as I wasn't harm, harmed physically. And uh, I did something to her that I think was more than slapping her. I told, they said, oh Myrtle, don't. I said, I'm not going to do anything. I said, I just want to go rubber and show her that it doesn't come off. So I approached the lady and I just rubbed her. Like that, you know, and she just oh, screamed and went out of the house. On the college level, Mr. Wilfred Pierre, now a member of Lafayette City Council, recalls his days at the University of Southwestern Louisiana in the early 1960s. There's no comparison to, to the integration, uh, say, on a high school level with that on, uh, say, on a campus like USL. We were a real closely knitted group and there weren't that many students on USL's campus at that time. So, so we were about, you know, we were like a family, and our haven was the student union. Uh, I want to say the Newman Center, not the student union, because we were still not welcome in the USL student union at that time, and this was in 1964. Welcome, I say, because, well, we were just not welcome as far as the relationship, the interaction with the other students, and sharing common problems, even within the classroom situation. We were having housing problems, uh, 
the extracurricular activities, the harassment from the, the, the house mothers and the, the den men, whatever you want to call them. So as far as some of the successes, we had some success, and then all of a sudden it was a tremendous failure. The black population on USL's campus was be be beginning to increase a whole lot more. The closely knit group that we once had uh, was beginning to dwindle. Uh, some attrition took its course, some kids just left, some kids just couldn't take the pressure, and they decided to leave. I hate to say this, but I feel that a lot of the students on this campus feel that people owe them something, mm -hmm. and they're not really aggressive enough to go out and do their own thing academically. One of Mr. Pierre's classmates was a North Louisiana girl, Miss Catherine Bonner from Jonesboro, who today is a professional librarian working on her Ph.D. I think, too, one of the biggest <clears throat> problems that um, I, I feel like has been overlooked in a subtle way, I suppose, was that the advisors to the black students didn't really care about the black students. And advisors would kind of set us up, really. They would put us in classes. Uh, for instance, if we were freshmen, I would, I'll never forget, in my freshman year, the second semester of my freshman year, my advisors um, scheduled me to take a chemistry and a physics in the same semester. And I knew that white students were not being advised that way. And I think it was a, a kind of way to, to weed us out. We wanted black house mothers. Here we were living in Jude East, a mostly all black dorm, and we had a, a white house mother. One, in fact, who did not understand our problems and was not interested in our problems and treated us as if we were less than human. In my senior year, when I did student teaching in the, in the, in the spring, but I had four observers from the university. And it bothered me that I had four to come in to observe my student teaching that day. So my advisor at um, Lafayette High, I did my student teaching at Lafayette Senior High, who was Mrs. Hannah, told me that um, they were really there to kind of physically, their physical presence was there to intimidate me. And she also told me later that I probably wouldn't be employed in, in uh, Lafayette Parish when I finished school because uh, they thought that I might start something. When our schools were, um, were integrated, that we, we only had our churches and our schools, and, when our, and our families, of course. But when our schools were integrated, that took a vital institution away. We, we, the blacks have always needed that institution. We could fall back on our schools when we couldn't fall back on our families or fall back on our churches. We had that institution to fall back on. But we don't have that now, and, and it's really taken its toll. The University of Southwestern Louisiana was the first in the state to be desegregated. One of the faculty members who tried to ease the desegregation process was Dr. James R. Oliver, a native of Egan, Louisiana, now the university's administrative vice president. And one of the persons at the university who had probably the most to do in officialdom with uh, certainly allowing, but more than allowing, encouraging, and in some cases <laughs> stimulating uh, changes to go on vis-a-vis uh, -vis desegregation was Dean Vernon Wharton. Uh, without that gentleman on the campus, I suspect our whole uh, approach to the problem would have been much different. Probably uh, many people would have suffered because of it, too. Uh, I guess one of the things that kind of um, opened his attitude up to the academic community was his book, that uh, his dissertation was published as a book. And uh, people read it here. It destroyed so many of the old myths concerning uh, the situation in the South immediately following the Civil War. And when they were aware of his book being published and then read it, it just sort of <laughs> left them defenseless. I should say a word, too, about President Joel Fletcher. The courts have decided we are going to go along with the courts, and there is not going to be any violence on this campus. I recall when uh, one of the so-called rabble-rousers, I don't know what history is going to record uh, their uh, tag, their label as, but uh, Senator Reynak, uh, who was very well known for being a segregationist, to be most kind, I guess, um, came to this campus and gave forth with a tirade 
and essentially challenged uh, the students, the white students particularly, to, quote, do something about it. And some of our white student leaders, to their everlasting credit, went to talk to him and said, Senator Reynak, we would like to have you leave the campus. And he sort of uh, blustered his way through a bit and uh, uh, was trying to, to recover from that kind of statement. And they persisted, please go. We don't need you here. Wilfred Pierre told us our haven was the Catholic Newman Center. The man who made it a haven was Monsignor Alexander Segur, a native of Crowley, who is presently pastor of Our Lady of Fatima Church in Lafayette. In the difficult early days of integration at USL, he was the chaplain of the Catholic Student Center, who felt a commitment to the black Catholics on campus. For all of us, it was rather new. We weren't aware of how exactly to proceed. Our understanding at the time was that the university was integrated by court order for academics. It was not spelled out in terms of dormitories, dining hall, student union, and the like. And uh, therefore, we began to feel our way through. We were challenged to try to find a pace at which we could assist these people in their difficult time, and at the same time, help the university through its uh, unusual stance, being one of the first in the South to integrate officially, and therefore we were to face the question of involving students in whatever we did. I felt in many ways that we weren't in any way heroic. Uh, it was just living day by day and figuring out what's the best approach. And at the Catholic Center, if I can just mention this too, there was never any physical trouble, serious, and then there never was really any economic boycott on the part of our supporters, although they always questioned these things. But there was a lot of criticism, a lot of it, particularly because it was the only place the students really went at first. And when you walked in and all you saw was black faces, it was not easy to answer that, and there's not much that you could do about it at the time. In fact, some of the students called our little library the Liberian Annex. Although it did not seem easy to the people involved, J.K. Haynes told us that in the larger perspective, USL was the easiest school to desegregate. Conditions there were peaceful compared to efforts in other parts of the state to integrate privately owned stores, the lunch counters of downtown merchants being a particular target. Attorney Murphy Bell recalls the situation of Southern University students in Baton Rouge. It was only in the 60s and the, the early 60s, somewhere during 60, 61, and 62, where you find coming on the scene the young black college activists, particularly up at Southern, led by Marvin Robinson, Weldon Rujo, and Ronnie Moore, and particularly Ronnie Moore. Uh, one of the things you got to say about Ronnie Moore was a young minister, wasn't more than about 21, 22 years, coming out of New Orleans. Very frail young fellow, but dynamic and fearless. Well, he was a freshman or sophomore up at Southern, and he was the one who organized this giant uh, march involving 5,000 kids uh, coming down there. Now, they came down as a result of the case where the young college students had sat in at a white drugstore called Sitman Drugstore downtown, and it was something to see when they had all these kids uh, lined up around the courthouse demanding that the these uh, their fellow people be released. Sheriff Clemens, without any warning, they shot tear gas and tear canisters into this crowd, and it just made them flee. All all these young boys and girls were fleeing everywhere to see if they can escape. Plaquemine came in around about 62, 63. That was when they had the big demonstration in Plaquemine, the confrontation. That's when cattle prods were first used on a large scale. This is when, this is where I would assume that if you would call it a revolution, this is when it was really spreading. 
because not only would you get this large group of people, but you get the whole town. Clackman was a was a was a, a small town that was literally consumed with this fever. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, the whole black community was involved in it. it not just one church, but just hundreds and thousands of people, and they were determined. And they really, and they really just put that little town under siege. They drove out the. The sheriff. I got a call from there to head on to Plaquemine because they was riding down in Plaquemine, you see. And it was really, when I got out there, everything was tense. I think uh, at that time, uh, uh, they had brought Jim Farmer, James Farmer from Washington, the director of COOL had, had, had come in, and he was there, and the white folks had heard he was there. And uh, I drove through the town, I saw these White people on these big horses with these rods, and I didn't know what was going on. And I, I drove on through the, the white downtown section. I got out to where the headquarters were, and everything was quiet. Couldn't see anybody. And uh, then I went back there, the lights turned on. I said, Man, you gotta be quiet, man. You white folks are mad today. <laughs> and I said, Well, where's, where's uh, Jim Farmer? He said, They gotta go back to the funeral home. I, went on, I said, what are you doing over there? I thought he was got killed. I said, no, they were trying to get him out of town. But they didn't know they had the funeral home watch. And so I went over to the funeral home, and sure enough, Jim Farmer was over the funeral home. I said, man, what you doing? I said, thing was really rough. They, they, they were, I think they were attempting to kill him. So what they did, so they let a hearse go out, and they made a hearse go down the, ri the river road. Now they got two ways to go to New Orleans. You can go by the... Oh, airline highway, or you can go down the river road, just follow the river. So they sent one hearse on a trial run, like it was going through town, and the people stopped and searched it. So the next one they sent down, like they were going to pick up a patient, and they sent it down the river road. So they put Jimmy in its casket, put him in the back of the hearse, and they ran down the, r the river road and got up to New Orleans that way. But the rest of the people were not they so did the fortunate. Same thing with Judson Davis. Well, they might have, but see, during that night, I think they got so mad when they finally they got Jim out of town that that's when they went, look like they went crazy. They started shooting tear gas all over the black, the a, black area of town. Of they the even, place. all over, that's when they, they started running all the civil rights lawyers and everything. They were, they were rough that, that night. <laughs> I was back at the headquarters getting mad as hell. <laughs> and I had a guy who had been driving me around, the good boy they called Black Beauty, yeah, yeah, Alvin Joseph. Yeah, yeah, he was crazy. He was no civil rider, and he had his gun. Let's get out of here. If yeah. anybody stop me, we go. He had his gun. And really, for strange thing, he drove right through this whole crowd. In an anecdote involving the infamous John Rarick, Mr. Bell makes clear how little dignity was accorded to black lawyers in the courts. A little before the case was supposed to be called, several crosses, Ku Klux Klan crosses had been burned. So as evidence, we couldn't get a fair trial. We brought two or three of these crosses, including the big one right in the courtroom. You know, we were going to introduce them in trial. And Ryder walked in with his cowboy boots, and he saw that cross, and he just took his hat and just threw it on one of the cross. <laughs> okay, let's, let's get started. I said, who the judge? <laughs> the Klan had been burning crosses around here tonight, and, uh, and uh, we don't think that in an atmosphere like this where they're burning crosses out in front of all everybody house that we can get a fair trial and so forth. We're going to put this trial out. We're not going to put it on old rule of motion. And, uh, he took the testimony in the trial. And, uh, and of course, during the trial, they had some of the white people and they got up there and they started referring to black people as and so forth. And Neil Douglas, never forget, he's a very dignified black lawyer. He got up to judge. Uh, I want to object. Uh, to these witnesses referring to black people as <laughs> and so forth and so on. And here's another moment in history I'll never forget. Rabbit just leaned back and smiled and said, well, listen, now, you've been hollering about your right to free speech. I said, don't you think these people have a right to call you a <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and all Nails could do was just say, well, Judge, I just want that in the record, that he's using the word <laughs> and so forth and so on. And Rabbit said, well, no objection over rule. Y'all come in here hollering free speech and you you don't want those people to have free speech. You say they have a right to call you a <laughs> if they want. <laughs> and that was, you see, that's the kind of atmosphere these cases was tried in. And nothing we could do but put it in the record. And most time you had to make these records, you got to, you couldn't just say it when you used the word <laughs> because that white clerk taking it, she would spell it Negro. Mm -hmm. So what the lawyer would have to do is my 
I want the record to show that this witness said in All right. <laughs> you got that reporter? Okay. Lifelong admirer of Murphy Bell, Mr. Marion Overton White lives in Plaisance, where he was born and practices law in Opelousas. We asked him how he got interested in civil rights. Well, it goes back kind of far. When I was in high school, uh, and this was at the time when my father was existing, there was a saloon that, which still exists right in the front of my mother's home, a white saloon. And uh, one night at about 11, maybe between 11 and 1 o'clock, that's a gentleman who came home, knocked on the door, and he said he was some first cousin or third cousin. He said it in French to uh, the late Robert E. Lee, and uh, he demanded that my father open the door that he described with some beautiful adjectives that was kind of new to me at that time because I was kind of young. I may have been in, maybe still in elementary school. And he banged it on the door and my father reached above the door and uh, grabbed hold to his prayer beads, which is a long old shotgun. And uh, my mother fought with him to keep him from uh, uh, shooting the man. I wondered why the fella came home. And then uh, Later on, there was a man from the uh, agriculture department who came home, and uh, there was a, they had quarantined certain uh, seed potatoes. And my father had taken his seed, the, the seed potatoes that were quarantined and destroyed them. And uh, the man came back to make a recheck. And when he came back, he uh, stated that uh, he thought my father was lying. In other words, he stayed this. He says, you're the first who lied to me. And don't you know that don't lie to white men over here? And uh, again, my father went uh, to his plow. At that time, we were using mules. And he was unhooking uh, what is known as a single tree, the thing that pulls the plow, the mule pulls the plow. Uh, a neighbor who lived in the back white neighbor ran across and uh, intervened and stopped him from uh, hitting the man with that. And uh, th from those two incidents, I became fully aware, and I presume I was about eight, nine years old, I became fully aware of the racist nature of the society. Those ins instances uh, or events, I think, uh, probably played the most significant role in uh, uh, leading me into the civil rights activities that I've, I have been involved in thus far. Mrs. Annie P. Johnson, a young girl in Jonesboro, became involved in quite a different way. We asked her how she started working for civil rights. Quite by accident. I had a cousin, two cousins that was going next it kept saying uh, when you're going down to that meeting they have meetings down there I said well I don't want to go so they didn't have any transportation one Sunday and I dropped them off and I was going to sit across the streets while they had the meeting they was having it on the front porch of what they call the courthouse and what at, time was this in? in Jonesboro mm -hmm. of Jackson Parish and I sit over there and they kept talking they started singing songs that got interesting so I decided I would ease over and listen for a little while so they said we're going to pick at the library Monday I think it was Monday. I know it was the next day, I think. And they say, uh, who's going to be in the uh, picket line? And uh, they say, you? I said, no, I'm not quite that interested. That's what you're going to do. So my cousin kept asking me to come along with them. And I, we, we went up there to picket the library. And, about, and we went uptown that day, and I was let out on the streets to picket the library. And about five minutes later, I was in jail. And that's where it started from. That's where I found out. I didn't even know why I was really in jail at that particular time. I had heard about different things, but I've always worked as far as uh, voters' registration. I got that from my mother a long time ago, and she's always had us to take an interest in what go on around us. But I really didn't know. That's where I learned the meaning of my civil rights in jail. We, the jailhouse is up on a hill, and it's right back a community, and we used to 
sit there and watch all the lights. We wait till everybody go to sleep at night, and then we start singing our freedom song. You see the lights popping on and off. You can hear the jailhouse, and then the jailer come beats on the door. We're going to turn dogs on if you don't shut up. You know, we would sleep all day long and sing all night. Mrs. Johnson explained how the black community in Jonesboro came to believe it would have to defend itself. There was a mention about the Klan. Was the, the Ku Klux Klan in Jonesboro? Yes. Uh, they, well, the first time that there were, there was crosses burned, but the first time I saw them, they were in a parade, and the police were leading them in a parade over the quarters. and. I think that that was the night that the deacons really got together because they had said they were going, they had made one circle through, we call it our, we don't call it streets, we call it quarters. We got black quarters and white quarters. Those are the terms we used for years. And when they said that they, they made one circle and they was going up and come back the second time, somebody got them the word. They didn't come back through. And I think that's really, I think, where the deacons of justice and defense originated from. They decided. From Jonesboro, the Deacons movement spread to Bogalusa. Mr. A.Z. Young, who was a member of the Voters League, tells about the situation in Bogalusa early in 1965. Uh, the community was without leadership. The white community was taking advantage of the black person because of fear in the black community. I was serving at that time as the president of the labor union at the Crown Zellerback Operation and employed by Crown Zellerback. I volunteered and took over the organization. I was not elected. I still served as president, never was elected. I took over the organization in order to provide leadership for the black community and try to lead the city out of the danger that we, we encountered. And as soon as I made it known that I was president of the organization, then the Klan put forth an effort to try to frighten me out of the same position. Uh, being a different kind of individual, I served a 168 consecutive days on the front line. Uh, and the first black tank battalion that ever fought in a European theater of operation as a staff sergeant in the United States Army. And I had watched many blacks and whites die and I thought that the time had come that if I could fight in defense of the Constitution of these United States, then I could fight at home in defense of my own peoples, my mothers, and my relatives. So I took the leadership, and I stood very far, and then we organized an organization called the Deacons of Defense for Justice, who picked up arms in order to protect our own. And we had all kinds of racial problems. And tear gas from the police, and some of the police was uh, on, in the Ku Klux Klan. There was a congressional report that was released in the city of Bogalusa to show what persons were members of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, I was in the leadership role for a very short time before I had pressure from all over the city. The Deacons was formed and the age limits was 21 and above. The Deacons was a group of persons, males in the black community who came together in defense of his own that was concerned about the protection of their wives, their children, and their, and their mothers. See, it, the deacon's name was Deacons of Defense for Justice, and not to create a problem, to protect your own. Mr. Young is presently Principal Assistant Secretary of the Louisiana Department of Health and Human Resources and handles the Civil Rights Office for that department. He was asked about his present position. I feel uh, very good about my performance, period. Uh, I work in state government. I've, I have been able to bring about a quite a few changes. And all the people that I've helped happen not to be black. And I don't see any different when a person is hungry, whether they're black or white, they're hungry. And based on me being a public servant for the state of Louisiana, I feel that as a person with uh, read up in a bad situation, should try to correct the ills and the wrongs that I've seen all my life. Mrs. Annie A. Smart was a welfare mother in the days before there were people like A.Z. Young in state government to help people like her. I grew up in Baton Rouge. 
and I went to school in Baton Rouge. So I, I really am a Baton Rouge girl. Oh, uh, later years after getting out of high school, I married Mr. Andrew Smart, and we had um, a number of children. Uh, we had two sets of triplets, a set of twins, and five singles, which mean that I had 13 children. Uh, long years after uh, things began to get bad, we married in December 41. Uh, December 7th, the same day of Pearl Harbor, so our marriage started off with a bang. <laughs> I think we stayed together about 14 or 15 years. But then Mr. Smart got unemployed, and that can destroy a family, especially if you don't have any kind of outlet, uh, any place to go for aid. And uh, that is the first time that I realized that the system was really doing people in because you could not get any help unless you were not with your husband. You had to be a single woman with kids in order to get any kind of aid from the state of Louisiana. And I thought that was the most horrible thing I'd ever heard of. So I guess that's when uh, my activity started, is that I began to deal with my own problems. So you end up uh, learning fast and furious what the system can do to you. And I began to start out with the uh, Welfare Rights Organization. It was born in 1968. So from then on, we gathered ourselves together, seven mothers. And with those seven mothers, there were 41 children. So you can tell we had a good uh, group just with seven mothers. And uh, we realized that each one of us had the same problem and we began to deal with those issues. We went about our business and let welfare department know that we exist and uh, let the city parish know that we existed. And not only objection they had with the organization was that it was named Welfare Right. So we sent them a letter back and letting them know that we still was going as Welfare Right and they just was going to have to live with it, just like we have to live with welfare and all the myths about welfare recipients. In 1969, 350 welfare mothers went to Washington, D.C. to talk to their senators about welfare reform. But uh, anyway, we went in to see um, the senator, which is our senator, or Senator Russell Long, and we didn't have the one at that time. And um, he was on the floor, and he bobbed around on the floor and said that, um, I want uh, you to get this bunch of broodmares out of this Senate and uh, don't let them come back here again. So George Wiley, who was our director at the time for Welfare Rights said, Senator Long, when you come up again to run for senator, Anna Smart is going to challenge you. And uh, at the time, I said to George, I said, George, you gone stone crazy. I said, now why in the world would you say that to the senator? He said, because it's true. Well, after years went on, um, it came more and more apparent that we would have to do something to challenge because he did nothing but put programs that would really do us in. So in 74, when the time came, we had no money. But we talked about the campaign and forgot about the money. We organized folks around issues. Um, we said that if we could get 50% of the black vote, and that was going to put him in a runoff. And uh, to him, that was terrible. But um, I don't know what would have happened if I found out the next day that I had won the Senate seat. <laughs> I didn't get that far. <laughs> but I do know that we really did a good campaign. And we did win a few goals. Well, as in 70, 69, 
that he was saying to us broodmares in 74, he was able to say Mrs. Smart. It cleans up the myth about welfare recipients that are illiterate and don't understand anything because I was a welfare recipient and was running for senator. What did the civil rights movement mean after all? Was it worth what it cost the people involved? Mr. Bush sums it up. You get up to the point where the price you pay, you, you might have to pay, is well worth, well worth it for the cause. No, in all, all things, uh, there is no gain without pain. And somebody has got to do these things. So why expect the other fellow to do that with something that you wouldn't do yourself? So you can't expect, all through history you find where men have paid quite a deal of price for progress in various areas. So why not you?